welcome to this seminar, welcome to this Constitution Unit seminar here at University College London, uh, asking the question, uh, if there is a snap election, what can we do to improve the campaign? Uh, my name is Alan Rennick and I'm uh, your chair for the session. Um, and I think this session couldn't be more timely. Uh, clearly a snap election is coming within the next few months. Um, and how the campaign is conducted could well be very important. Opinion these days is very volatile. We saw in the 27 election campaign a huge shift in opinion during the campaign. Theresa May started off expecting to get a big majority, of course, she ended up without a majority. And that kind of change during the campaign could easily happen again. So the campaign and how the campaign is conducted may well matter. Um, but I think no one would uh, suppose that we should be conducting the campaign as we have conducted election and referendum campaigns in recent years. A cross-party parliamentary committee uh, has labelled the current legislation, uh, particularly relating to digital campaigning, as not fit for purpose. Our broadcasters have acknowledged um, that uh, they do not do a good enough job, or they have not recently done a good enough job, as in 2016, in helping voters to distinguish well-branded claims from claims that are exaggerated, tendentious, misleading, outright false. Um, voters are frustrated, often disgusted, by the state of our politics and our political discourse. So, um, there's a lot of dissatisfaction, and the question we're exploring this evening is what can be done about it. Um, clearly, if there's going to be a snap election, then the legislation relating to election campaigns is not going to be changed in time. The government says that it is working on uh, updating the rules, at least in minor ways, but that's not going to have happened in time for a snap election. So our focus here is on what the rest of us can do outside government uh, on, uh, it, within the existing uh, legal framework. Um, some of us will, you, will be aware that we at the Constitution Unit have been working on these kinds of questions um, for quite some time. Um, and many of our ideas relating to fact-checking, voting advice applications, ways of developing um, better forms of discussion among voters are set out in this exciting report, um, doorstop of a report, uh, which we published earlier this year, uh, uh, co-authored by me and by Michaela Pelese, and uh, generously funded by the Google Trust. Um, we have a few copies of the report sitting at the front here. I'm very keen not to have to carry them all back to my office. <laughs> so if you don't have a copy of the report and you would like to pick one up, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, so tonight what we want to do is take this conversation further, a uh, conversation about these ideas and about a range of other ideas uh, on how we might do election campaigns better by discussing them with four people who are uh, the leading people in their respective fields um, in this uh, particular area. So Dorothy Brown, um, at that end, is Head of News and Current Affairs at Channel 4. Her uh, McTaggart Lecture at the Edinburgh Television Festival last month uh, made some headlines. She argued that politicians um, must be willing to submit themselves to detailed scrutiny to the media, which often they're not doing at present. And that broadcasters must, must do more to call out lies and help voters discern what's really going on. She said, um, more than a little provocatively, uh, that here is what we all, in broadcasting that is, need to decide. What do we do when a known liar becomes our Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> Ed Humphreyson is Director General for Regulation at the UK Statistics Authority. Um, the Statistics Authority has been <coughs> notably forthright in criticising campaigners' misleading use of official statistics, not least during the 2016 Brexit <coughs> campaign, uh, and particularly in relation to the infamous £350 million uh, campaign uh, made by the Leave campaign. And in contrast to other regulators, the Statistics Authority has been um, quite keen to take that role further. Other regulators have been very cautious in this area, um, whereas the Statistics Authority has been um, notably bold. Uh, then we have Joe Mitchell, uh, who's di a director at Democracy Club, which is an organization that seeks to build the digital foundations to support everyone's participation mm -hmm. in the democratic um, It's best known for uh, crowdsourcing data on election candidates. 
And if you have ever searched for information on your polling station, then you have probably used a tool that was developed by Democracy Club as well. And last but not least, Will Moy is Chief Executive of Full Fact, the UK's leading independent fact-checking organisation. And Full Fact has pioneered the use of authoritative, unbiased fact-checking in traditional media since, uh, since it was founded in 2010. And increasingly, it's also working with Facebook and others uh, to embed fact-checking as far as possible in a broad range of political discourse. So, the plan is that each of our speakers will speak for around five to eight minutes. Then we'll have a bit of a conversation among ourselves. Um, and then we'll open it up to the floor. I should say that Will, unfortunately, has to leave. He's a very busy person. He's got another event to go to. Uh, so Will will have to slip out, but we'll try to make sure that we get, give you the chance to um, ask some questions to Will before he leaves. So enough from me. Uh, we'll move straight over to Dorothy Brown. Thank you very much. I'll remain seated. Uh, thanks very much for asking me. Um, well, the first thing I would say is don't underestimate what we have and use what we have. In this country, we have regulated television, which uh, we are forced to be uh, accurate, fair, and duly impartial. Lots of countries don't have that. They are very jealous of it. And uh, we should treasure it and not keep undermining it and talking about people watch it less, etc., because people still watch it a lot. So 75% of people say TV news is their main source of news, and 71% of people trust it. And that's way more than um, other media. Um, we need to persuade our leaders to use it and to be heard of it. All broadcasters have complained about politicians not appearing on TV. Um, Theresa May, now Boris Johnson, Jeremy Corbyn have been avoiding the sort of in-depth interviews that even David Cam as recently as David Cameron and Ed Miliband used to do. This um, deterioration has been swift. And I, I think we, you know, you as academics, we need people to really note this mm -hmm. and talk about it because it's really happened remarkably quickly. Um, so in the Tory leadership campaign, Boris Johnson did the absolute minimum. Uh, mainly, um, he relied on events organised by the Conservative Party. He did two interviews and um, uh, the one debate. Um, and I think the, the key thing is that politicians must be seen to be believed, quite literally. Um, another point about this election is it's very difficult, this election, as coming. I mean, regularly I have to ring Gary Gibbon to ask him to explain to me what's happening. Because it, what's going on at the moment is really difficult to understand. Brexit is very difficult to understand. So I think broadcasters and everybody need to do a lot more explaining than they normally do. And I think some of you may be aware of some research the BBC did about how people don't understand economic stories and say that on the news, they want the background to the economic story to be explained each time the story is done, whereas journalists' natural reaction is, well, I told you on Monday, why do I have to tell you on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? And to be honest, if you even ask people, what is the FTSE 100? They probably wouldn't know. So we need to have a lot more explaining, particularly in this election. Um, and we need a lot more fact-checking. I think a lot of us have relied on the fact-checking being online, but we need to build that fact-checking much more into our television broadcasts and 
we need to do the fact checking a lot more quickly as well because often the story goes out and then a brilliant fact check appears four hours later online for geeky people like you to read. And of course, we need to not be afraid to call politicians out when they're not saying the truth. And we don't have to... I heard a ridiculous thing on the radio this morning. Mark Mardell, was it, saying, well, if people refer to, you know, if a party arises that believes in blue bananas, we have to cover that. And rightly, Robert Peston said to him, well, as we know, there are no blue bananas. We should just say there are no blue bananas. So I think the BBC needs to explain due impartiality to its leading um, correspondents. Um, we need politicians to be straight with us because of the huge lo loss of trust. Channel 5, two weeks ago, did a survey of 2,000 adults. I don't know if you saw it. 70% said they didn't think MPs were honest. 77% said their trust in politicians had fallen significantly since the Brexit vote. And 9% believe politicians are untrustworthy. So this is a crisis in trust. And to win trust, politicians need to appear on trusted media to be held to account. By all means, they can appear on other media, but actually, if they themselves looked at it, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, I think it's something like 10% of people trust news on social media. So we also, as broadcasters, need to use a wide variety of methods to reach people on air about the election. You know, we can't just rely on the news. We've, we, we've got to really cover this election a lot. I mean, a lot more than we've covered previous elections. We need a lot more special <coughs> programming because it is so difficult. Um, I'm very interested that after I criticise politicians for not always telling the truth, um, uh, quite a number of leading on and off screen British television journalists emailed me, some using their private emails to say what you said was really important, absolutely right, and needed to be said. And I waited for them to publicly <laughs> say it. <laughs> and lo and behold, they didn't. So come on, you know, we shouldn't live in fear of politicians. And one very leading TV presenter emailed me from his private email address. And I thought, it's not like we're having an affair. <laughs> Why would you not email that message from um, you know, your own address. Uh, interestingly, a couple of regulators emailed me to say it was great. I thought they probably shouldn't have used their email address. <laughs> um, but I think also, <coughs> politicians and journalists, we have to agree we're on the same side. We're on the side of democracy. So although we should call politicians out, we shouldn't be sneering and disdainful about politicians. And actually, I don't think we are. I think most journalists, when you talk to them, will say they rather admire politicians and will say, well, they do a job I would never do. Generally, the journalists are better paid than the politicians, just for a start. So um, I think, you know, we just have to say we all care about democracy and democra it's not just a matter of this election, I feel that democracy itself um, is uh, um, in, a, in a state of crisis because of the crisis of trust. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you uh, Dorothy. I think one of the uh, nice things <coughs> to me about following uh, Dorothy in the order of speaking, it's, it's a really uh, nice contrast because you're going from someone who represents an organisation that pretty much uh, everybody knows uh, and whose product pretty much everybody consumes to someone, uh, an organisation in my case, that 
uh, very uh, few of you know, very few members of the public know certainly, uh, and whose product you consume uh, inadvertently or, or, or uh, in, in a kind of subtle way. And I should say I'm fine with that uh, sort of relative lack of, of profile. Indeed, uh, my job description used to be Director General at the UK Statistics Authority. And in 2016, you know, that pivotal year in, in sort of public discourse in, in the United Kingdom, uh, we changed uh, my job title to Director General for Regulation at the Office for Statistics Regulation at the UK Statistics Authority. And the reason for the change was that we thought that old version uh, just was not boring enough. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, what we do is fundamentally, um, it's about the nuts and bolts of the provision of information. Uh, and a lot of that is very upstream, uh, it's important, crucial, uh, we all rely on it, uh, but it's not necessarily a particularly high profile. So the question element you posed is, what can organisations including regulators do within existing constitutional arrangements? The answer is a lot. Um, you mentioned that uh, we unusually have not been cautious, and as I was going to say, we are not cautious, uh, but we're also very clear and focused on what, what we do and what uh, we, we, we should be doing. And what we do, as the Office for Statistics Regulation, is aim to ensure there is public confidence in statistics. Why? Because those statistics provide a bedrock uh, of debate. Uh, they help frame people's understanding of the world, uh, they can guide the choices people make, and uh, things like the size of the economy, the size of the population, uh, the rates of crime, the health of the population. Uh, some of you may have seen some very interesting statistics only this morning about cancer survival rates. Things like that are really important in guiding the way people uh, understand the world. And we think that's increasingly important in a world uh, that uh, where you can all sense is uh, abundant, rich. Uh, almost uh, uh, overpoweringly so with data from all, all sources. So our role is to create the conditions for, for, for public confidence. Uh, and we start by, uh, this is it the upstream bit, the boring bit, we start by ensuring there is a reliable supply of good statistics from government. Uh, that's our focus. And it's, let me be clear, that's where lots of the problems arise. We're looking to address problems when the ONS uh, or a government department like on for health, or the Scottish government produce statistics which are unclear uh, or incomplete um, or um, full of errors. A really good example of this upstream work is that we recently removed the gold standard designation uh, from the ONS's Office of National Statistics, Statistics on Migration. Uh, they do a quarterly figure on the number of people migrating to the country and I should say with their agreement, uh, we removed the national statistics designation, removed the gold standard to give a very clear signal publicly that uh, these statistics were um, not as reliable um, as, as previously. And that's a lot of our works upstream, uh, probably not very much in the public uh, eye. Our work is underpinned by three core concepts. The concept of trustworthiness, um, which is about the organisation producing the statistics, their competence, honesty and reliability. Um, any um, students of trust and trustworthiness will recognise uh, the traces of Enora and Neil's work in that. Um, the concept of quality, so that second con uh, concept, uh, are the data any good, basically, and the concept of value, do the statistics actually tell anybody anything useful about the world. Trustworthiness, quality and value. And in this kind of world of information abundance and fact bombing, where it can kind of feel like the currency of good information gets debased, we think those three things, trustworthiness, quality and value, are absolutely fundamental. And the great thing about those concepts is they don't just apply to somebody like the ONS or HMRC or uh, the Scottish Government or the Welsh Government. They can apply to political parties who are using statistics in public uh, debate, how they communicate with statistics. Uh, we think there are really significant threats from the way that they, they do that. Um, and there's probably a whole different uh, lecture in, in, in what the nature of those threats are. But let me pick out two. The first is what we call inequality of access. So that's where a party, a politician, will say something, they'll, they'll kind of spew out a figure uh, uh, on a subject, and it's a um, figure that they've calculated themselves or their team's kind of calculated, and it's impossible for anybody else to verify because it's just casual and offhand. 
um, and um, we school that unequal access, and we really think it's a very poor practice. Uh, and the second uh, kind of um, harm is grossly misleading representation of what statistics actually say. If you're interested, we've just published an annual report summarising all of our work on that. And I think that gets to a really core point about elections, is that we don't see elections as um, a different category. They are really salient battles in a much broader information war. Um, just as much as we stand up for not debasing the currency, not kind of spewing out uh, rubbish information uh, in non-election times, uh, we stand up for it in election times. It doesn't really make much difference to us. And in fact, we're quite unusual in government because most parts of government uh, will shut down in an election period, or perda, um, and they will, will not say anything. We continue to do our work. Uh, and let me just pick out a couple of examples from um, recent elections. Uh, in, 2015, um, uh, 2015 election, we criticised the way uh, ONS and other statisticians were producing income, uh, uh, statistics on income, uh, household income, and that was really skewing and creating a really, uh, really broken debate about uh, living standards. In 2015, we also highlighted the use of unpublished information by Jeremy Hunt on private healthcare. Uh, in the 2017 election, we raised concerns about uh, the publication of information, or the lack of publication of information on, on NHS trusts um, by, uh, by NHS uh, England, um, uh, under the criterion of equality of access. And in 2016, and Alan's already referenced this, we, 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 we were um, known for, for stepping into the space of, of that referendum debate. It's worth saying that we, um, we criticised the government leaflet. I don't know if you remember, there was a government leaflet published by the government and it went through everybody's letterbox and had lots of facts and figures about membership of the European Union. I should say it was supposed to land on everybody's letterbox. I didn't get one. And I, I did wonder at the time whether that's because they had a list like people not to send them. <laughs> uh, uh, because they had some errors in it and we, we uh, pointed this out that this was misrepresenting what the statistics actually said. Uh, and I say that just to balance the thing that we're more well known for which is um, being very clear that saying that the contributions to uh, the European Union amount to contributing from the amount of we was a misleading representation of what the statistics actually said. So that's what we do. We stand up for good statistics in an information rich world. We do it in peacetime, we do it in the wartime of elections, and it doesn't make any difference from us, and I think that does make us different. Can I just have three caveats very quickly? Um, we do not police uh, public debate nor do we check every statistic. Um, and in fact, I'm quite happy when public discourse is informed by evidence. I think that's a quite, quite a good thing. Uh, we just want it to be done well properly, but we shouldn't sort of feel as though our job is to criticise every time it uses a number. Uh, and the reason those first two caveats hold is a third caveat, which is we have an amazing ecosystem of people who are concerned about the problems of evidence in, in the UK, uh, including uh, excellent forecasters, excellent fact checkers, and people facilitate democracy, and um, we're just one small part of that ecosystem. So don't expect us to step into every debate, but when we do it's important, because public confidence in statistics is a crucial bedrock of democratic debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I didn't get the government leaflet in 2016 either, so it seems to be a passion uh, <laughs> developing it. Uh, Sure. Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, thanks uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, I helped run something called Democracy Club, um, and I will talk a little <coughs> bit about what that is in a second. Uh, but I thought it more interesting to start with what I see as the problem, as a problem that gets overlooked, particularly by the kinds of people in this room, because it probably isn't a problem for you. Um, uh, I sort of come from a bit of a digital background, in digital land, we talk about user need a lot. If you cannot identify the user need, you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. But I think there is a problem here um, to do with the very basic bits of information you need in order to engage in the most important bit of the democratic process, an election. Um, and I know this because I've looked at Google search insight data. So in 2015, uh, the top 10 searches into Google uh, on election day, all related to election, to the election on that day. Uh, and they were not um, 
particularly difficult questions often. First one was quite difficult, it was who should I vote for? <laughs> <laughs> so that's maybe five, ten million people searching for that information on election day, I still don't know. <laughs> the second one uh, was more simple, it was who are my candidates? Um, the third was how do I vote? Uh, fourth and fifth sort of were very similar, it was where do I vote or where is my polling station? And so the problem I see it is that there's a sort of lack of incredibly basic voter information. Uh, and the world in 2019, and it did in 2015, expects that to be available online or expects that to be easily accessible in the way that vast quantities of other information is. Um, you know, the flick of a, or the tap of a screen, I can, I can, I can, I can pull up information on all sorts of things. But I can't find out who my candidates are or where I should go vote. Um, so there's sort of that giant public demand for this information. And if you read Doing Democracy Better and excellent report, he says, you know, do not confuse this with, with trying to give voters more information so that they write, make the right decision next time. It is just about respecting the voters' demand for information. And I think that's really important. Um, uh, I also sort of live in Twitter universe, and it's a lot of fun to see sort of anecdotes data leak, uh, data leak mm -hmm. might be a word, um, some of the problems people have. So classic include, um, went to vote, didn't see Theresa May or Jeremy Corbyn on my ballot paper. And of course, <coughs> no one saw both of those candidates. <laughs> um, at local elections, classically, it's sort of, oh, I was supposed to vote for two candidates. Um, so there is this, this sort of extraordinary lack of, sort of public awareness on how to actually vote. Um, and lastly, I'd say that, the, and we will probably talk a little bit about disinformation. I think in the absence of quality, digitally accessible information on really basic elements of the voting process, it's incredibly easy to fill that vacuum with nonsense. Like, oh, you need your voter ID to go vote today. Oh, well, I'll stay at home then because I don't have mine. And do people, uh, there's some of the extraordinary statistics that came out of the cabinet recently. Something like 90% of people think you need ID or a poll card to go vote. <coughs> and if that's still true at the general election, we're all failing. Um, so what do we at Democracy Club try and do to solve some of this? Um, and I'll leave you to consider whether it's sensible that this sort of vital national digital infrastructure is provided by a tiny non-profit. Um, and have views on that. Um, um, and we talk about digital infrastructure. I like, that, I like that phrase because we have physical infrastructure for democracy. We have Palace of Westminster, although it's falling down. Um, and we're about to spend sort of five to seven billion <coughs> squid to be doing it. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we sort of spent that zilch on the digital infrastructure of democracy. Um, and that's quite broad, but even just on elections. Uh, when are elections happening? Do we have a sort of digital register of elections? Uh, do we have an ID system for candidates, register of candidates? Um, and the answer is no, the state provides none of this. Um, so Democracy Club uh, is a sort of group of something like 20,000 volunteers, uh, in non-partisan fashion, uh, we collect information. Sort of nerd election spotters. Um, so we run now, fairly, we think, the best register of elections that is happening, the best register of candidates, and we uh, gather information <coughs> as we can, and we make that available to voters, both through our own websites um, and through publishing the, our data sources such that anyone, including uh, Channel News, if they so wish, um, can build tools to help voters. And the key here is going where the voters are, and the voters are on Facebook, uh, they're searching Google on Instagram or something. Um, and by producing open data on this stuff, we can give it to those companies, and those companies can build relevant tools to help voters in that way. Um, thank you. Um, a quick caveat, digital does not mean online. So do not come away thinking, ah, but 10, 15% of people aren't online. That doesn't solve their problem. Well, it does, because if you're a sort of local librarian or something, and someone comes in and says, do you know where the polling station is? You can't answer for that person because everyone's address is so treated differently for a conversation. But you can go online for them. Or you can print a poster up and stick it on the window. You can only do that if the information is accessible in a nationwide way. And that's what we try and do. So that's what we will do for the upcoming general election. And hopefully it will make a difference. It is extremely difficult to cover the entire country. Uh, but with sort of three developers working on a national uh, polling station finder as one example. Um, we think 
there needs to be serious thought given to uh, making this the role of a public institution, whether it's the Electoral Commission, whether it's someone like the BBC, um, or in the long term, whether we need to ape a model that I'm particularly fond of from Germany, uh, where the Bundeszentrum for Politische Bildung, and I go on about this, it's a federal agency for civic education, it was hugely well funded, and then anything that's happened in the UK, it does education in schools, uh, it does adult political literacy, it educates journalists, it does on field trips to Israel, it runs one of the most successful online vote quizzes in the world, used by 15 million of something like 60 million German voters. Um, and in the UK, we've just not provided that. And I think that's a, that speaks to us a political culture, and sort of assumption that everything will be fine with Britain, democracy is fine. We've just forgotten to invest in democracy and to like, drag it into the 21st century. And so we will do our bit, but uh, there is much more that needs to be done, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, and thank you all for coming and for your time. Um, I'm from Full Fact. Uh, Full Fact fights bad information. We're a group of fact checkers and campaigners who find, expose, and counter the harm done by bad information in our public life. And make no mistake, bad information ruins lives. It promotes hate, it damages people's health, and it hurts democracy. If you think back to the last election, where we were all merrily going about our political arguments until one shocking day it was interrupted by a terrorist attack. And everything stopped for a while. And then it happened again. And again. Some of those attacks can be linked directly to false and distorted information online that helped radicalise people to the extent of violent attack. And leaving aside radicalisation and terrorism, from all directions. We see the division between communities promoted by bad information, whether it's the demonization of disabled people on benefits by uh, spreading false statistics and false analysis statistics about welfare claimants that we've seen, whether it's the remarkable overestimation of the Muslim population in this country, or the fact that Many people believe that so many, so many teenage girls are pregnant that I think there would have to be one in at least every class in the country. We have ended up with an amazingly distorted view of the world that promotes prejudice and reinforces prejudice. That information damages people's health. A few weeks ago, a woman, a mum, rang up our office and said that she had been trying to work out whether to vaccinate her children. And the only reason she was able to conclude that she would vaccinate her children was that she found our work online helping her decide that she couldn't trust the false information that vaccines were dangerous. That information can cost lives. And on a much more abstract and election scale, that information about who's using health services, that information about where the need and demand is, about how we allocate health funding or how we regulate healthcare effectively, can lead to government decisions that, again, cost lives. And as we've seen in the last few years, bad information hurts democracy. Um, perhaps we've made it startlingly obvious recently. There is something sickeningly wrong when all but one in five of us are willing to assume that politicians don't generally tell the truth. And it's wrong on both sides. It's wrong because it begs politicians to live down to those low expectations. And it's wrong because we all deserve better. So Full Fact fights to make that better. And faced with this challenge of what do you do about a snap election now, and let's remember we are in an election campaign now that just hasn't been officially declared. Faced with this challenge, you've got to think, well, what we really should have done years ago is integrate fact-checking into the mainstream media. And serious broadcasters are saying fact-checking has to be an important part of our outlook. And to their credit, way back in, I think, 2005, Channel 4 led the way uh, by creating Channel 4 Fact Check in the UK. What we should have done was protect the independence of our statistics from political interference by law. And to their credit, in 2007, Parliament voted to do that, and that was what led to the existence of the Office for Statistics Regulation. 
what we should have done is fought to make sure that the politician can't selectively release statistics about benefit claimants or anyone else with misleading and false briefings attached to them so that we all have equal access to the information we need to do democracy well. And full fact complaining to the UK Statistics Authority and the action they subsequently took put an end to that abuse of your money and their power. What we should have done was make sure the newspapers couldn't turn down complaints about the inaccuracy of their articles based on the fact that the people complaining weren't mentioned in the article, so that they can make a general false claim, and there was no one available who was allowed to complain about that inaccuracy. We complained to the Press Complaints Commission way back in, I think, 2011, got that rule overturned, and now hundreds, if not thousands, of corrections have happened in the national press because those rules were changed. What we should have done was make sure that details on where you can vote and who your candidates are are available to everybody. What was 8,000 volunteers, and I'm delighted to hear is now 20,000 volunteers around the country, corralled by Joe and Sim and his colleagues at Democracy Club, changed that for us all. And what we should have done was make sure it wasn't just available on a website you might find through Google, it was actually available through Google and through Facebook, and they did that too. That was pretty impressive. I could go on. My point is, an amazing collection of people, and I'm proud to be sitting alongside a few of them, have been fighting to make us have a good, robust democracy over the last couple of years. And we have found things we can win. We have found ways we can make democracy stronger. It is a dismal year from the point of view of the quality of democracy. I'll go on to that. But let's remember, firstly, that there are people working all out to make this better. And secondly, it's not one-way traffic. We are winning some of those fights, and we must keep fighting. So we are in an election, and it's going to be a peculiarly difficult election. We have political parties. We don't know which ones will be fighting this election yet. Will there be a pact between the Brexit Party and the Conservative Party, between Labour and the Liberal Party? Will those parties still exist? Will the run Conservatives form a new party? Will Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn be leaders of their parties? Will there be a deal or no deal or some new deal? All of those are open questions in this election that we are currently fighting and expecting to have polling day of before the end of the year. For a fact checker, this is a slightly bewildering election. <laughs> on top of that, if you weren't bewildered simply by the facts on the ground, there are hostile states who would very much like you to be bewildered anyway, to find democracy so confusing that you give up on taking part in it, as if we weren't working hard enough to make it too confusing to take part in it in the first place. And so for the first time we will have active government monitoring of hostile states' actions to interfere with our democracy in this election. We are seeing a rise in abusive campaign techniques, particularly the role of dark advertising online, which Parliament has failed to act quickly enough to tackle. And so it falls to charities like Full Fact and non-profit volunteer organisations like Who Targets Me to scrutinise the use of adverts and money to distort this election. And just by the way, because the election hasn't been officially declared yet, most of the election doesn't apply yet. So the protections that we do have in place are not in place until the election is called. But above all, we have this invisible campaign. Not just online, but not on TV either. Politicians who don't see the need to answer questions. Politicians who think that if they are going to answer questions, they should pick what the questions are and make damn well sure that there's no follow-up question. We would rather do questions on Facebook to a selected audience <coughs> than questions on TV to a much bigger audience when they're not in control. If you want a government where the politicians are in control all of the time of what they say and what they're asked, we're no longer talking about democracy. So we have to be very clear about what we do next. Full fact will be all out for it, scrutinising the claims day by day and hour and hour, hour by hour. We have invested in artificial intelligence technology over the last few years. That helps us respond sometimes in seconds when politicians get things wrong because we know the challenge that Dorothy talked about. We will be exposing 
abusive campaign techniques. And crucially, we will be looking to work with the widest possible group of volunteers and charities and organizations that share the value that the public deserve to be treated with respect in the information that is used in this election. So let me just end on what you can do. Firstly that, let's treat each other with respect. It's been a hostile, it's been a polarizing, it's been a difficult few years. It's very easy to be the intellectual snob. It's very easy to look at people who reach different conclusions to you, have different life experience to you, and assume that they're either stupid or malicious or anything else. We need to make, I think, all of us an extra effort to look around and empathize with everyone involved in this campaign and this election through our sex. Secondly, that one thing we can all do is decide what we share and what we talk about with our friends and family. Online, that's a very deliberate but quick decision of what you click to share. Just slow that decision down and decide, actually, what do I think is genuinely worth my friend's time? That's a little bit of power that we all have. But the most important power I think we all have is what do we expect and what do we accept? Are we actually going to tolerate an election in which our local candidates don't turn up and answer questions? It's the easiest thing to do. You can sit behind your newspaper tutting. You can throw things at the screen at the non-existent politician who didn't turn up. What are you going to do to actually hold them to account? You're the voters, we're all the voters. It's up to us to make these things stand. The democracy has to be treated with respect before we can even worry about what the outcome is. How do we raise our expectations? Instead of doing that so-called sophisticated thing of, well, politicians lie, they've always lied, so that's all right. And then they live down to that expectation. What are you going to do to push back? And then finally, we are very lucky to have some strong institutions in this country. The Office for Statistics Regulation is funded from our taxes with independent government. Channel 4 and our other regulated independent broadcasters are funded from license fees and advertising. Democracy Club, in full fact, are funded by volunteers. They're funded by the few hundreds or thousands of people who have decided to help make it possible to do the work we do. If you think it's necessary to scrutinize politicians, if you think voters deserve to be given the information that they need to make their own minds up and make their own choices, <coughs> one thing you can do before you even leave this room is get your phone out and go to Democracy Club or go to Full Fact and say, I want to become a supporter. It's a small thing, but you'll be part of that small crowd of people who have won so many victories over the last 10 years. Those victories are worth fighting for and have to be fought for year in, year out. And I'm very proud, as I said, to be one of the people who are doing that work. Thank you. Four superb presentations. Thank you so much. Um, there are many, many questions that could be asked. I shall ask two only. <laughs> so that we can get to the audience as quickly as possible and people can ask really particular questions before we ask you. Um, so two questions uh, relating to two of the themes that I thought came out of there. Um, so Will talked about fighting bad information. Um, so that's one theme. And then the other theme is promoting good information. Um, so on fighting bad information, I think my question is really how. And in particular, I was struck, so, so to be a little bit provocative, I could ask the question, does it help to brand the Prime Minister a liar, or does that actually just produce a counter-reaction from the other side, and you get branded as, as a liberal, elitist, um, uh, a creature of the establishment, and people start <coughs> listening. So, it, 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 is it better to be dispassionate? But then, countering that, if we're dispassionate, do we become utterly boring? As, as Ed was kind of suggesting. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so how, do we, how are we sufficiently interesting to get people's attention without becoming um, polarizing? Uh, in in how, 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 how we deal with bad information. And then, second question, um, how do we promote the kind of information, good information, that, uh, that Joe in particular has talked about? 
Um, so to what extent is there a role for broadcasters? To what extent should broadcasters, as Joe was nudging, uh, be carrying information on candidates? Uh, who should be <coughs> promoting uh, these virtual advice applications, these, these online quizzes where you can answer lots of questions and get guidance on which parties or which candidates are closer to you in terms of your preferences? Um, how, how, do, how do we get beyond the, the stage at this election, um, where Joe and his merry band are, are, are fighting for everyone's attention, but it's very difficult for them to break out of uh, a relatively small network. Um, I mean, I completely agree with what Joe said about the desirability of moving towards having some kind of publicly funded independent body that is responsible for promoting uh, good quality information, but we're not there now. Uh, so what can we do in this election? So those are two questions for me. Uh, shall we go in the same order uh, for this round uh, for the audience? So Dorothy first. Um, well, I think you made a good point uh, that lots of people will say, well, politicians have never told the truth. And actually, we have to wake people up and say something different is going on now and if one has to be a bit provocative and yet truthful um, because nobody has said that what I said wasn't true um, then you you know you, you've got to get journalists and the public to recognize that there has been a big change both in the acceptance that truth is absolutely um, has primacy in democracy or it doesn't work and that things are different and yes we obviously have to promote good information but one other thing I think we have to do is without insulting people explain to them you won't necessarily be able to tell the what's true and what's false by asking your chums and thinking, what do I think? Um, some of you may be aware we did a survey of more than 2,000 people and we gave them six stories, three were true and three were false. And I was shocked that only 4% of people got that right. And then I thought, well, why should they get it right? Because they... They can't sit there all day and research whether stories are true. So I also feel that journalists must speak up for their own trade. We get, you know, constantly attacked by <coughs> politicians as, oh, they're the mainstream media. I'm also chair of an international charity, the Ethical Journalism Network. And I'm always saying to journalists, stick up for the importance of what we do and point out to people that whenever people want to destroy democracy, the, the, the first group of people they have to either silence or kill or imprison are journalists. And say to yourselves, why is it that anti-democratic people need to get rid of journalists? Oh, it must be because what we do is really important and remind the public that what we do is really important and we have a real role, stop putting ourselves down as well. I only slightly exaggerate when I say I, I, I could fill my working day and evening with going to, uh, going to events and talking about how do we challenge the bad information. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a surprisingly good demand for a particular brand of, 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 of dull technocracy that I, I, I represent. <laughs> it's surprising, but it's, it, it's there. I'm often, at this point, you're wearing a tie, because I'm often the only person on the panel wearing a tie. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I, I, I find that disappointing, that there, there, there's a sensational demand for events like this. Because what I really want to do is um, initiate and participate in discussions about what not misinforming the public looks like, but what informing the public looks like. What is what is good here? What is what is it that we're aspiring to? Which is why I think your work is so important. Because actually, you're you're, you're in a sense you're not contrasting yourself with some kind of 
piece of wicked information that you're looking to kind of punish. You're looking at a vacuum. There's no information and you're looking to fill the vacuum. I think we should spend more time on the good information side. I have a terrible answer to your question now, Alan. What do we do to promote the good information? I think we don't have a very good discourse about what good information is. I think we're pretty uh, keen to talk about what bad information is and misinformation is. Look, look at the DCMS report on misinformation. You know, chapters and chapters on misinformation. Very little on what good looks like, which is why your report can be waived again. Um, I think you've got some really nice criteria there about inclusion, bridging, open-mindedness, which is sort of saying, well, this is what we should be looking for. So my view is we should spend a lot more time on the good side of the coin than the bad side. Yeah, I agree with Ed there on the, on the, on the bad side that, it's, that there is a vacuum problem. And promotion of goods, a couple of things are interesting to me. I think TV news is still the most trusted form of news. But among what age is there a sort of young, go online, middle of elderly go to TV? There's something about the way information reception of TV is about broadcast, you know, the golden age of TV, switch on a 10, someone in a suit will tell you what to think. And I think the expectations have changed about how you're to receive information, and we haven't, we're just not meeting those expectations in the same kind of way. Digital allows us to be more innovative, um, and crucially it is interactive, and, and that change in expectation about how you consume information, how you engage with information, um, is something we are perhaps lacking in terms of the promotion of good. A sort of confused point. Perhaps. The second one is more obvious, which is that I really want to create some sort of social <clears throat> social norm that it is everybody's job to help everybody understand how to vote. So I've been speaking to a few sort of companies and saying, well, what do you do to your staff? Do you explain to your staff how to register to vote? McDonald's, do you send an email out to all your staff the night before reminding them to vote? Um, you know, X youth brand, can you lend us your digital billboards on election day? I want to kind of inculcate this idea that it is everyone's responsibility to promote good information, particularly at elections, although we can look forward to that. Good, thank you. Well, um, well, that brings me on to the rest of my list of good things um, from earlier. Um, one of the things I'm both proud and ashamed of is a project called Need to Know that um, Full Fact and the Statistics Authority and the House of Commons Library and the Economic and Social Research Council kicked off in 2016 and the idea was that before we have another major public vote we should think about the questions we'll be thinking about then and make sure we have the information we need well in time and that we've collected the data that has been analysed and it's clearly communicated. And ironically it was run over by the snap general election in 2017 and not having the capacity to do both it was need to know the suffered. Good information is the long term play um, and millions of people come to full fact for information which somebody once described as a beacon of accuracy and meticulousness. Everything we say comes with links, so you can check it for yourself and look at it for yourself. It's information which is designed to be judged and evaluated and reach your own conclusions about. But it's information which is absolutely dependent on the primary providers of information, the researchers, the government offices, um, and so on. And we need them to step up. It's something we argue in a report called Tackling Misinformation in the Open <coughs> Society. Is exactly Ed's argument that government policy in this area is focused on the whack a mole game of tackling individual instances of interference, whereas actually the better policy is to raise the sea level for everybody and to invest in things like independent official statistics, things like the role of the House of Commons Library, things like political education. And talk to governments all around the world, and that is the one part of our argument that is really, really hard to get anyone to take seriously, and I find it shocking. I'm just going to come back on your very specific question about should we call any particular politician a liar. Dorothy took a view on this in her lecture, which if you haven't read it, you should. Um, our view is that it is up to the people who use our work to reach their own conclusions about the motivations of the people making their claims. Our job is to give you information that we can prove and demonstrate to you using sources. We cannot prove anything about a person's motivations using sources. And therefore it is up to others to work out what they do about that. But as I have said several times over the last few years, I have been worried that not just in one party and not just in one person, we may be approaching a real dangerous shift in the culture of British public life when it comes to honesty and accuracy. 
and it is an open question how we respond to that effectively. Thank you. Um, Will needs to go. I'd like to do at least one round. Of yes. Sorry. So, um, uh, video camera can stay on. Uh, if, if, so, if anyone has qualms about uh, appearing on the video in the question, then uh, please let us know, and we can cut you out. Um, but um, new constitution, new policy is that video camera stays on. Um, so, questions particularly for Will. Let's just see how many we have at this stage. Uh, so we've got three, four. Uh, should we, if you can do questions very, very quickly, then hopefully we'll be answered. <laughs> okay, so specifically for Will, um, you said we have a problem with um, distortion of information. Um, I just wondered what you thought about um, Carl Miller's point um, from Danmark. So he says that it's not necessarily distortion, it's more like confirmation bias, and um, people who are the middle ground are just reinforcing slightly more extreme um, opinions. Um, and then just for the whole panel, well, um, aside from improving information um, to electors, um, are you working at all on um, like campaign funding or money in politics for those areas that we need to improve as well? Thank you. Um, Brian Walker, BBC. A uh, particular question for um, everybody, but Will, first of all. Nobody's mentioned <laughs> the written press, uh, which is absolutely remarkable. They actually affect broadcasting. Well, barely. You haven't discussed it. They, they haven't really been discussed in detail. Um, you guys are absolutely ter terrific, in, but are you not in the way uh, fighting against the tide of false news and digital information? And don't you somehow need to attract the press? They do use you all, but not enough. There is only one Tim Hartford. You need to do more. How do you target them better? Question for Dorothy. Dorothy, in the um, lead up to the pending period of the campaign for whether it's an election or a poll, how do we avoid an eight-way split potentially? Eight-way splits in bits and in packages. We see that question time has been fiercely attacked as being an outmoded forum. This is going to get very, very much more difficult because of the, the number of party splits throughout all the kingdom, Scotland, Wales, and England. Thank you very much. And the person just behind Brian. To the whole panel, how realistically and effectively can the quality and impact of micro-targeting and black advertising be monitored during this election? Just a little question. Uh, <laughs> and there was one over here as well. Yes. In respect of, um, in particular, Twitter, this is for the whole panel, but more particularly for Dorothy, um, what you see reported now, both on air and in print, is just what, is, what a politician uh, has tweeted as if it were fact, as if what they were saying was fact without any reference whatsoever to its context, or whether there are other views on it. And you see that both in, um, in the print, press, and on television. And you see it done consistently. So where before, before Twitter and other things came along, you ha would have a spokesman saying something, uh, then there might be the opportunity to put questions. Now it's automatic on Twitter. That's being reported as if it's fact. And there's no comment, there's no nuancing. And that, in my view, because of the torrent of stuff that is coming out now, and because every politician is tweeting, this amounts to a tide of dis potential disinformation which the media receives, and where they think it's important enough, they, they, they put it uh, out to the public without co comment or context. And I think that produces a very distorted bias. And this is, in my view, a major problem with this forthcoming election. Because Twitter is now so prevalent, and it's reported all the time in the press and on, on television. Great, thank you very much. Um, let's allow Will to answer those as he wishes, and then we'll move down. Great. Um, Excuse me. Well, I think you're sharing. I, asked, I was going to ask one question, if I may. Um, you may. Bring it on. Yeah. If I may. I'm just a retired engineer. It seems to me that since 2016, up to the present time, the whole of the political system has actually been thrown upside down, both in this country and in the States. You mentioned possible external influence. Is this being paranoid to think you could have something like right wing meshing with certain 
countries, I won't, you know, obvious, whichever we're thinking of. And this is, is just an explosion of that, or is it because of our own um, inadequacies in, in monitoring our own systemic situation for the past few years or past 10, 20 years? Thank you very much. If that makes any sense. Yep. I yeah, apologise. It's an important issue. Yes. Let me try and do brief replies because everyone appreciates them. No one is not being paranoid to imagine that there are hostile state actors who will deliberately try to interfere in democracy, persuade people to disengage from democracy, and so on. It is not plausible that that is the major cause of uh, politics in the UK at the moment. Um, and there is not any good evidence that I'm aware of to say that, that that is the biggest driver of what's going on, or even really a major driver of what's going on. So it is a real risk that needs to be monitored and been aware of, but it is not something where you can just say, oh no, well this is, this is foreign interference, um, based on the evidence I'm aware of, and there may well be other evidence I'm not aware of, but that, that is my understanding of the situation. This is a risk, but there are plenty of problems in our democracy that are purely homegrown. Um, which brings me neatly on to the question of newspapers and Twitter. Um, Twitter represents a number of things that are happening. One is that politics is happening faster and faster, and there is an expectation of more and more instant reactions to more and more things. Um, by less and less qualified people, almost by definition, because if you had time to be briefed by somebody who knew what they're talking about, you wouldn't be able to tweet in time to have the word. Um, this is a difficulty, and it's probably not. You know, one of the things that Neil, really who Ed referenced, said is that in systems designed to find truth, you have very deliberate rules about how you do it. Think about the court system, think about academia. The way politics works is the opposite, it's a free for all, and at the moment, speed is being rewarded. And that is not the best way to accuracy, it's not the best way to thoughtfulness. And one of our challenges, therefore, is to recognise the huge opportunity of politicians being able to talk directly to and hear directly from a wide range of people, whilst recognising it might take a certain amount of self control to get the best out of that without losing other valuable things at the same time. And newspapers are part of the problem as well as part of the solution. Newspapers, um, unlike broadcast news, much less trusted on the whole, sometimes even by their own readers, um, to tell the truth and get their facts right. Um, they are part of a partisan um, news world, and some parts of the media, um, Lord Justice Leveson found in uh, conclusions that were uncontested by the newspapers, prioritise their political agenda above their commitment to accuracy, particularly on some topics. I don't think that will come as a wild shock to any member of the British public. Um, on the other hand, they are some of the most important sources of information for many people in this country, and we need to work with them, and we do work with them. So Full Facts has had regular columns in a whole range of um, British newspapers. We've worked with The Sun, we've worked with The Evening Standard, we've worked with the whole range, Telegraph, Guardian, you name it, and we will continue to do so. In the next few weeks, we'll be sharing more about how we're going to be working with media partners during this campaign, and we have ambitious plans to do that. I think it's really important. Uh, but we have to recognise that we will be fact-checking them and asking them to correct the record when they make mistakes, as well as treating them as partners in trying to inform the public. And that's a very difficult balance to get right. Um, we do not have the ability to effectively monitor uh, dark advertising online because Parliament has not updated the law to make that possible and the voluntary concessions made by the internet companies who at least have done something when Parliament has done nothing are not enough. What we need is full transparency of the content targeting reach and spend of all online political advertising in real time in machine readable formats. What we have is a long way short of that. So no, we can't adequately monitor the impact of this kind of advertising. I would just remind you that there is an entire form of political advertising banned in this country. You cannot put political adverts on TV. We have recognised as a country that we might want laws to restrict political advertising um, because that's the best way to have an effective democracy. We have not had that debate about online advertising yet. Politicians have just not got there despite the fact that the Department of Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee has asked for emergency legislation before any election. They were right to do so, we did so too. 
Um, and finally, on confirmation bias, you're absolutely right, and Carl is absolutely right, um, to say that that and other psychological traits that we all share are part of what makes it hard to make good information stick and be useful to people and to counteract false information. The idea that that's the whole story is where I get off the bus. Um, when you sit in a think tank, you have one perspective, and it's great because it's high altitude, you get to look at a whole load of things. I and my colleagues look at individual claims day in, day out. We look at what the Prime Minister says, we look at what the leader of the opposition says, we look at the front pages, we monitor what's trending on social media. It's not just confirmation bias people. There are people who are lying to you, there are people who are making things up, there are people who are bluffing, everybody's bluffing. There are people who just don't care. And we have to do something to hold them all to higher expectations. So that's my final message to you. Firstly, I'm sorry it's incredibly rude to leave like this, but um, I have to talk to rich people in order for us to do that. <laughs> 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 watching back the video to find out what I got wrong. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Both inspiring and insightful as ever. Joe. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, no, I'm not a huge amount to add to what Will said, really. Um, yes, I should say, don't feel free, free you need to repeat that. Yeah. We don't want to get to um, more questions. I mean, I think part of this is that I'm Youngish, uh, digital and the internet is a new technology, and we're still working out how the hell we deal with it. Jimmy Gutenberg invented the press and a bunch of scurrilous rumor and horrendous stuff was published. And it was a while before we sorted that problem. Um, so I'm sort of got to more optimistic about things. Michael, I think it was called actually. Let's mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> not get there. Um, <laughs> on micro targeting and dark ads, we'll plug them earlier, but do look up who targets me if you don't know them already. Um, this is the idea that you know you are being targeted, but hang on, you also have the power to capture what is being shown to you and to pull that collectively. You know, collectively, we can find back this stuff. <clears throat> Worth also looking at Canada's, uh, the work Canada has done, probably the leading uh, country on uh, thinking about disinformation and their plans for the October election. And also, I can't, I can't remember if it's France or somewhere, they just flat out banned uh, political ads on Facebook or even like political discussion on Facebook, so two weeks before the election or something. Um, there are things that can be done. Um, that's that, that's that, that's that. On the written press, I come back to the idea that. People go online and go to digital because it's um, because it's highly personalisable. You know, I don't get my weather forecast from looking at the newspaper anymore. I got my phone and give me a personalised weather forecast to where I am at this moment in time. Um, we don't print all the stocks in the FT anymore. You can online search for the thing that you are looking for. We can provide a better personalised service online. That said, um, the Guardian have used our data. They've got a very nice thing on their website. Mirror Group use our data um, to from things in all uh, their local press websites all over the country, that's very nice. And lastly on finance, I'm really interested in this. I think this is it's sort of crazy that we don't know who's paid for the election campaigns until after the election, when you know they pay for it with a credit card, or there was a bank transfer, there was a digital exhaust there that, should, that could be automatically captured, and we could show you in real time, here, is your, here are your candidates, they have raised money from this people, this people, this people. And in the USA, not, Always the bastion of fantastic democracy. Um, that is, I think, how it works. You, as soon as you donate over a certain amount, it triggers a real time reporting mechanism. Um, that's just a no brainer, I think, for the actual commission and electoral law going forward. So we have donation reporting weekly, if I remember, during general election campaigns, but not during referendum campaigns, local election campaigns, the European. So, in comparison with the electoral events that we have this year, we should have better information in an election campaign. It's been fact <laughs> <laughs> but I completely agree that it could be much better. Um, so, I won't, I won't go through all, all the questions. Just want to actually pick up where Shane left off and I'll answer the question about um, some broader reforms beyond information. So, uh, the cheeky way out with me say, well, it's not really my job, I'm about the information. But I think you're right. I think there's uh, there's quite a lot of sort of um, Victorianness in the way that uh, the, the kind of electoral system is designed. I think it's, it's, it's definitely something to think about reforming. However, 
uh, me thinking about things from a kind of provision of reliable information perspective. One thing I'd say in this conversation in general, we're talking a lot about elections, but I don't think that's the only uh, sort of choice forum in which all this stuff matters. Um, people are making choices uh, all the time, and of course, from what we know about behavioral science, they're not rationally, coolly looking at, at numbers and making kind of uh, ultimately efficient choices. Of course, they're not doing that. There's lots of mix of, of, of factors in, in, in things. But in there is some of the information which, which, which gets through. So I'm not just thinking about um, you know voting. There's things like uh, commercial decisions by companies, small and large, about where they do and what they invest in. We certainly hear uh, about companies choosing whether or not to invest on the basis of their perception of the political and economic environment, and that's informed by information that they consume. Thinking about community groups, you know, community groups who might want to oppose something which is being put in their area, they, they're opposing it, they are acting as a, you know, as a democratic exercise, it's not an election exercise, and it relies on them having access to information that they can use, so it's, they can sort of weponize in their, in their campaign. And then there's sort of like all these infinitely subtle ways in which we all understand the world, how many people, you know, whether we think our, our island is crowded or not, uh, whether we think you know our population is well or not, and how that then influences our choices. I think all of those things are really, really important. So I suppose that's just a plea to say, yes, there's probably some reforms to do to elections, but we shouldn't think that information is just for elections. Information is information is for life. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, journalists shouldn't just retweet. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, I encourage my friends and family don't just retweet things. Be aware that if you retweet something, you're somehow giving support to that. Um, on the point about campaign funding, I think we have to find really, uh, we should investigate it in the old fashioned way, but also find different and interesting ways to expose what goes on. So in one recent election, we got a real multi-millionaire and we sent him undercover to political parties and he posed as a potential donor and my goodness, they were friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't ask him a lot of questions and he met a couple of very strange people that um, one particular lunch that he was invited to. Um, so that I, I, I think it may still be aware, uh, 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 available online that programme, so that you can just get a little bit of a hint of um, the stuff about the donors. In terms of the eight-way split, here's why I'm so glad that I don't work for the BBC. I, I criticise them a lot, but I more feel intense pity for them. There are so many of them that they form committees in elections and uh, discuss how to do everything really fairly. And I'm surprised it's only eight ways and not 25 ways. And I would say to them, think what's the most useful thing for your viewers. And for example, I don't know how they're planning to do if they get a leader's debate. Goodness knows how many people they'll be planning to have in it. <laughs> but in the end, there'll only be one prime minister. So work out who's likely to be the prime minister and have them in your debate. So um, Dorothy, you're constrained by law, man. We have a pending period in the campaign. It, it's, you're not, you don't have the freedom just to choose, nor do you, of course, in John Ford News. Well, um, you have a lot more freedom than the BBC seem to think you have, because I've never, I've been doing this job for 20 years and I've never been hauled before a court or Ofcom or as having got it wrong about representation. There are ways of fairly representing candidates without being uh, an obsessive counter about it. Put the viewer first, or the listener, and worry about not upsetting committees second. 
Thank you. I think we're going to have time for one more round. So let's just see how many. Yes, it's going to be quite a big round. So um, <laughs> we can go for brief questions as far as possible. That would be great. Uh, so I'll, I think you're all on this side. So I'll just start at the front and wander back. Okay. So uh, John, I think your hand up. Thanks. Um, we've been talking about the general election, though it's a single event, but actually 650 simultaneous events. And if individual voters are going to participate effectively, they need to know about the range of candidates, the range of issues, and the, the dynamic of the local campaign, and that is unique to each constituency. And that's a different information challenge, and not one that we have discussed this evening. When I was at school, you knew there was a general election because people had posters in their uh, gardens. Candidates had public meetings. Um, in the local uh, news agent, you could sit by copies of party manifestos. They were on sale there. And all candidates sent election addresses. So you knew none of those things applied anymore. It's not in the constituency which I live because <coughs> it's, it's, it's a foregone conclusion what the result is. So there is no local contest. And I am excluded from this process entirely. What Again, do I do about it? Uh, Nigel, did you have your hand? Yes. The, the conservative commentator Ian Dale has a radio program which is very fond of quoting. And one of the, the things he comes up with every time is that in, he gets phone calls from people who, in 2016, the referendum, voted for the very first time in their lives, and they voted for Brexit. And his line is, to betray them by doing anything else but Brexit is a very special betrayal. My question is, do... Um, th these uh, former virgin voters have any special rights in a democracy? Uh, <laughs> or or, or the, to take the opposite view, would that be terribly arrogant and say, well, you didn't vote before, you need to learn about the voting system? Yes. <coughs> Gosh. <laughs> um, it, <coughs> it, when you have misinformation used on the media, um, it takes a few people will check it at uh, reasonable speed. Uh, Dorothy was talking about the responsibility to try and get that fact check up fast, but the number of people who will later do that check is comparatively limited at the moment. And I'm just wondering, approach the whole thing from the point of view of prevention and prevention has a weapon in deterrence. You will be found out. And if I take the Channel 4 example of your uh, Channel 4 fact check, uh, it's interesting that was mentioned earlier. Now, I'm an above average viewer of Channel 4. For example, I watch Channel 4 news about three nights a week. Uh, and although I've heard brief mentions in passing of it, I've never used it, and I've never heard, for example, at the end of Channel 4 News, and don't forget, you can go on. And I'm thinking that if there were also, in the BBC uh, and IGV generally, um, something where you actually advertise that, and maybe during the general election campaign, which we all foresee coming, that would be an opportunity to trial doing something of that sort, and indeed getting people rather used to it. And the other quick thought <laughs> is um, that uh, the evading of scrutiny, if, for example, um, the uh, uh, democracy club were to uh, invite the uh, lead candidates in the parties to uh, indicate whenever they are on for a substantial interview, and you publish the list of how many interviews, uh, it might get across to people that certain candidates are up for it and others are evading. We should explain that Peter is a former MEP and knows about being a candidate. 
question that we should read. Do you think the club should be reviewed given concerns because of practice Great, thank you. Press in the middle. Um, my question is for Ed Hunterson because I think it relates to the point you mentioned about the importance of quality and in particular the um, uh, incorrect interpretation of what might be accurate information under the interpretation. And it's, there's a thing that I notice in particular is that people conflate fact and forecasts. Uh, facts as what I would understand to be a statement of established realities and forecasts to be predictions of potential realities. And it's made all the time by parliamentarians and frequently by broadcasters as well, where a, a forecast might be used, and it could be from an established source like a Treasury or the Bank of England or some investment bank, some usually on the economy. Um, and it's, it's, I'm just interested about how your organisation can go about doing that, because they are different things, and frequently they're used, and people will hinge on them. And therefore, because there's such a wealth of information of facts going back a long time, and also forecasts going a long, a long way, People on all viewpoints can find a fact or a forecast to fit their narrative. And in a debate, they will frequently both use facts and forecasts to support themselves. Great. And oh, there's someone I missed at the front, sorry. Um, in terms of uh, journalism, journalists have a duty to report, uh, to promote truth for a healthy democracy to function. So we're talking about a Brexit and the impact on Britain. Uh, journalists also have, so it's one crisis, but I also see another crisis we're facing this election, which is journalists has a duty in terms of peace reporting to promote peace, um, and in terms of the crisis we're facing in Northern Ireland, which is a return to the conflict of the troubles of the Colonial um, or any type of current order. Um, do you think British media is doing enough to do responsible peace reporting when they are reporting? Are they including Northern Irish voices and peace workers? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so two quick questions. First, of Ed, when will you decide to interject yourself into the, um, <coughs> the debate and challenge uh, um, errors that you see? And to Dorothy, um, Nick Robinson, before he left as um, political editor, he used to complain about politicians going and giving a statement to the camera and saying, don't even bother sending a journalist because I'm not going to take any questions. Just send a camera. I'll, I'll give my one minute to camera that will be on all the news programmes. And he said the only way that we could ever stop that happening is if all the broadcasters just refuse to put those on the 9 o'clock news or the 7 o'clock news. Or at least as they're walking away from cameras saying, and this politician declined to take any, any questions. And you know, <coughs> seeing them walking away from the cameras, scurrying away, it's, it's actually sort of quite powerful. Are you actually going to do anything to try and stop these you know, one minute uh, hits, hit and runs that the politicians are doing? Right. Have I missed anyone? There? No. Okay. Ed, um, you haven't had a chance to go first. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to just respond to three questions, two of which were kind of raised directly to me, and one um, I think I can comment on. Um, so when do we decide to uh, intervene? I mean, that's, that's clearly a, a challenge. Uh, and there's two components to it. One is, um, when do we decide to intervene if somebody complains to us? And the second is, when do we decide to intervene regardless of whether we received a complaint? So in the first case, somebody complains to us, we will always respond. So if you see something, you can uh, email me, you know, go to our website, or we'll use our, our inquiries, and we will uh, always seek to give a view. It's extremely rare for us to say, that's not in our agreement. Um, so in a sense, the way I look at that is, what's our criteria? And our criteria is somebody cares about it enough to email us about it. If you see what I mean, it's sort of, uh, who are we to judge what's important? Nevertheless, we do have the kind of discretionary capacity to judge uh, what we uh, think is important. And there, we, um, we don't really focus on uh, the extent of wrongness in itself. Um, and, uh, we also recognise that it's, it's kind of possible for people to speak off the cuff and, and, and make a slip. What we look for is the recurring, um, either uh, unverifiable statement, because there's no equality of access, that the material isn't published, or something where um, a, a misuse has become kind of embedded and repeated to the extent that it's risking 
substantially misleading people as to what the underlying um, uh, situation is. So that's really the test that we use. It's quite a parsimonious test. You know, it's quite a it's quite a high bar. We we definitely don't see ourselves as fact checkers. We see ourselves as being kind of one step uh, uh, more remote than that. In terms of the tax test forecast, that's a really, really good question. Um, at one level, I kind of think I don't distinguish between them because these are, this is quantitative information being used to inform the public. Uh, you know, the difference between saying we, we currently have an economy of this size versus if you follow my proposal, we'll have an economy which is twice the size. I think asking the public to kind of differentiate between those two types of statement is you know, asking quite a lot. So in many ways, we have the same expectations we would expect somebody who's drawing on a forecast to draw on a forecast which is publicly available, uh, that it is you know, verifiable, that their, their statement of what the forecast says is true to what the underlying forecast is. If you saw it, you know. We looked at that a lot in, when, in the 2016 referendum when the Remain side were talking about it, um, it's each household for us and around uh, 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 a year was it now? I can't even remember the, the claim. Do you mean uh, Osborne's statement, the one that each household could lose one thousand four hundred fifty pounds? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> hey, this is what that. First, yeah, that's so, the so, um, so there we we be very clear with the Treasury that they needed to make absolutely transparent how they arrived at that, and it was also needed to be completely clear uh, and verifiable how the kind of remain campaign had got from the Treasury analysis, the model to their, their, their kind, of, kind of statement. So we apply more or less the same things. I think the one thing which is different is that the, 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 the kind of um, corroboration of the forecast against kind of the, what we know about the world is much harder. With, the, with, with statistics which are describing the world as it is, you can say, well, how, how can there be this many a real example, how can it be that this many uh, student migrants staying in the country, as the, 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 the migration statistics were saying, because they're not, if you look at the visa records, they're not overstaying their visas, so something must be wrong with the numbers. You can do that uh, for descriptions of the world in its current state. Forecasts, you don't, because you don't have the kind of triangulation points. So you have a lower standard of quality in that sense. But we really emphasise this, that we think the principles of trustworthiness uh, replicability, they can apply to forecasts just as well, and we, 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 we do say that. Um, and that gets me onto the PERDA rules, uh, if, if I can, because I've said that we um, we continue to operate uh, as an authority and make the comments that we make. Does everyone know what, what is meant by PERDA rules? Mm -hmm. just, this, is the, this is the suspension of normal official communications during the election period. Because of course the government has ceased to be, um, so there's a risk that the civil servants look like they might be serving the outgoing government if they start to say things. To protect the civil service and protect the public from that risk, there's a further rule which means no official uh, things are, are said. Um, and because of what we do, which is um, provide confidence information, which is never more important than in knowledge, we carry on doing that. I think the PERDA rules uh, kind of make a lot of sense, but I think they just need to be adapted for, for, for the environment in which we're in now, in which information is such a, so abundant and so completely available. So I'd, I'd not radically reform them, but I just recognise um, that the kind of role that we play is so important and it should be kind of more strongly, strongly supported by the And also perhaps some government experts who are able to comment on you know, avian flu or, 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 or you know, these disease outbreaks, you know, you sometimes feel they like can't comment in election periods, but they are the experts, <coughs> and I think lifting the kind of restriction on that is the And I think you have been criticised by the Electoral Commission in the past for, for, for speaking out. And, uh, uh, well, I don't know if there's anybody in the Electoral Commission here. They, 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 they wrote us a letter which, which sort of said, we really ought really to be careful about that, but we, yeah. we carried on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so clarification that you can indeed carry on might be useful, but you might, it might, it might be you don't think that yeah. 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 Great, thank you. Dorothy. Um, in terms of local elections, I think the aspect which is barely discussed is the collapse in local newspapers and what, as a society, we are going to do about that because it effectively means we don't have local democracy in this country. I began on a local paper and one of my jobs was 
to cover the council planning committee and to write up every single planning application in great detail. Now, all over the country, local councils are covering themselves. Somebody told me yesterday that at its height, the Birmingham Mail had 240,000 readers and that it now has 12,000 readers. What is the effect of that, if it's true, I haven't checked that figure myself, but he was somebody who used to own the Birmingham Mail, so I felt he probably knew. What's the effect on that, of the local democracy of that? Um, we should definitely put fact check on TV more, and I'll remind people of it. I completely agree with that, and I'm always saying it to them, and I'm going to go back and say, I just went out and they were all saying what I keep saying. <laughs> That's proving I'm right. Um, yes, we have to tell viewers what they are not seeing. We have to empty chair and we, and we have to protest. And when Theresa May wouldn't give us our, or Channel 5, uh, an interview during the last um, Conservative Party conference, which was like a historical first in anybody's memory, other broadcasters wrote a public letter of protest. And in terms of what we shouldn't use, <coughs> no broadcaster used Boris Johnson's Facebook Live to the nation. None of it's used to. I'm not saying we would never use a clip of it. Um, um, I, I don't believe we should all get together and say we're never going to use it. That feels sort of not our role, but the fact is we didn't use it because he got to ask himself a question and then answer it. <laughs> and that isn't really, um, he has been a journalist, but we can't call that journalism. But I think we should also point out more perhaps um, when something is, uh, you know, a joint, where we've all been told, you know, it's a pool interview, you don't get to ask your own question, and um, also, when we get to ask only one question, like Jeremy Corbyn quite famously said to Kieran Jenkins, um, our Scottish correspondent, you can ask me one question about the uh, about Europe. Well, we said we got to ask one question about Europe, and then of course he didn't answer it. So um, when I did a bit of work on this, a number of journalists pointed out to me that press conferences are often no longer real, and we should point that out to the viewer. So it looks like a press conference, as you've always seen it. The politician is there, and the journalists are there. But the politician has, in fact, already had a word with some friendly journalists, or, you know, whether friendly or not, they've made an agreement. And the only questions um, that are allowed to be asked are the pre-arranged questions. And all the other journalists, you see, putting their hand up, having a hope in hell. So how do we explain that to viewers? And I think we do need to think how we explain all these things better. Mm. Good, thank you. Uh, do you want, can I ask Dorothy a question? Oh, very exactly. <laughs> no, no, just, just time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 if, 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 if there was a minister here who's not fearing, you know, turning down interviews, what's your kind of sell to them? Is it this is never necessary evil, it's your duty to be accountable, come and answer the questions. Or is it that by doing that, they get some benefit? Yeah. Do, do you see what I mean? Yes, I would definitely say the first, but I would say that second. 75% um, of people use us as their main source of news, and they trust us, and they don't trust you. <laughs> so you could borrow a bit of our trust <laughs> by appearing on our program and being showing that you are held to account. Yeah. That will actually increase the amount of trust that the public have in you. Have I have convinced you. Uh, well, in, in the bizarre world in which I am that person, yes, you have. Oh. <laughs> 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 Joe. Sort of question about first 
first-time voters. Um, all I'd have to say about that is that the best guarantee, or best predictor of whether someone will vote in an election is, did they vote the last time? Um, so there's certain like love bombing of first-time voters that has to be done, I think. Uh, better research into what they need, what barriers they face, um, etc. Uh, once they have voted, they not worry about it anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, list of interviews, crowdsourcing a list of interviews, I quite enjoy that idea, that is the sort of mischievous thing that we could uh, curl a thousand volunteers to do, I quite like that idea, I'll think about that one. Um, crisis and journalism, look, yes, I mean that's a missing bit of the panel actually, mm. it looks at Alan, um, yeah. and then you can blame that on digital technology as well, so the ad revenue from local newspapers disappeared because Facebook and Gumtree and Google and stole it all, um, that's why it's the content. Incredible. Um, so some sort of regulation of those folks is good. And the BBC is trying to do things like the Local Democracy Project, where they've paid for, BBC now pays for a bunch of journalists that sit in local newspapers and just cover democracy. Is it working? Not terribly sure. Um, but I think that links to your question, John, um, about actually there are 650 events. And funnily enough, that was the founding reason that Democracy Club exists. So a bunch of, sort of techies were like, Disturbed that there was one national conversation happening when, in fact, the internet enables us to organise ourselves into 650 uh, constituencies that will exist um, and identify what we care about in our constituency and then to go to those candidates and say, well, these are the issues we care about, where do you stand on those? Of course, it turned out there was no list of candidates, no list of email addresses, so we're solving that problem. But I really want to come back to a world where we do more of that sort of, sort of almost like crowd run journalism at that local level. I mentioned hustings. I love a hustings event. We will crowdsource a list of hustings for the general election. So if you visit our website in the election period, it will say these are your candidates and these are some hustings events happening near you. Um, and we might, if we had more money, we'd probably try and run our own hustings because I think that's that valuable. And then of course, the real question is about competitiveness. If it's not competitive, then no one has to bother anyway. And it's a kind of horrendous statistic that the local elections in May uh, we counted around 150 to 200 seats, I think, uh, that were won by the one candidate that was showed up. 68% of wasted votes in general elections that don't affect the outcome. Right, so now we're going to sort of systemic change. There's a certain method where I think the voters are actually pretty rational uh, to be the care about elections because they think the system is wrong. So a, that is part of that grand big picture of democratic reform as well. No one's quite picked up the question about Northern Ireland and uh, whether uh, journalism is in, at risk of undermining peace in Northern Ireland. Well, I think some is, and I mean, I hope we try never to um, in, in, inflame feelings, but there, there is journalism like that, and we should all call that out. Yeah. Um, Wonderful, thank you. Before I ask you to join me in thanking our fantastic panel, let me say just a couple of other things. First, there's a report. You might have heard <laughs> <laughs> There are a few copies here at the front. If you'd like one, feel free to pick one up. If you don't want to carry a brick home, it's also available online, uh, entirely free of charge, and it's full of lots of fantastic stuff, so do please read it. Uh, secondly, um, the next Constitution Unit seminar will be taking place in October, and I don't think we have worked out what it's uh, exactly at one yet. I'm looking at Rachel. Um, these are very fast changing times. <laughs> there will be a seminar on something very topical. <laughs> if, you're not, if you're not on the Constitution Unit's various mailing lists, uh, do please get on to them uh, so that you can find out about that. Uh, I think there's information on the banner there about um, how to do that. Um, I thought that was a really fantastic discussion. I learned a huge amount. We learned a huge amount about what each of you is doing, could do further. Um, very strikingly, we also thought a lot about what everyone um, what particular actions we can take, but also just how we can think about our politicians, about our journalists, about our democratic system. And I thought that was really, really powerful and important. So, um, thank you for three wonderful presentations. And thank you.